Luke chapter 16, the verse that I wanted to preach on is beginning in verse 15, where the Bible reads, And he said unto them, Ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts, for that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. And what I want to preach about this morning is the new morality versus God's word. The new morality versus God's word. You see, today in 2015 America, there's a certain morality, a certain accepted practice of what is right and what is wrong, and it's contrary to God's word. You see, in the past, our nation had God's word at least as a standard for right and wrong. Even people who didn't really believe the gospel of Jesus Christ still look to basic Christian morality. They look to the Bible for principles on what is right and what is wrong. But today there's a new morality that's not based on the Bible. You see, pretty much every single person that you talk to, whether they be a Christian, atheist, agnostic, or some other religion, has some type of morality. They have some concept of what they consider to be right and what they consider to be wrong. Very rarely would you run into someone who just said, well, everything's okay. Most of the time people have rules that they go by, whether it's biblical rules or something else. And because our nation has turned away from the Bible in so many ways, now that void has been filled with a new morality. And, and this morning I want to point out some of the differences between the new morality in America and God's word and God's laws. Now, first of all, in this verse, it says that that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. That's pretty big of a difference right. when the world is highly esteeming something and saying, this is great, and God's saying, that's an abomination. Right. Now, if you would, go to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Isaiah 5, verse 20. While you're turning there, I'll read for you Proverbs 14, 12. The Bible reads, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof, are the ways of death. See, this new morality, it doesn't claim to be based on the Bible. It just claims to be based on common sense. Right. Uh, we all kind of just know what's right, don't we? Do we really need the Bible to tell us what's right? But the problem is that there's a way that seemeth right mm -hmm. unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Plus, a lot of people who say things like, oh, just follow your heart or just use common sense. What they don't realize is that their minds have been programmed by TV and the media. Yeah. It's not that that all came from their own heart. It's that it's been put there over the years by very bad people. But look at Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. Flip over to chapter 55 of Isaiah. See, right there it talks about how what one person considers good, someone else could call evil. And what one person considers evil, one else would call good. And the Bible has to be the standard for what is right and wrong, not this so-called morality. And I'll get to the meaning of that word in, in a few moments. But look at Isaiah 55, verse 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Go to Ezekiel chapter 18. So in that verse, he stated that the way that we think of things is not the same way that God thinks about things. See, your thoughts are not my thoughts. Your ways are not my ways. And my ways are better. My ways are higher. My thoughts are higher. You have a much lower, baser morality than I have. That's what God's saying. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 29. Yet saith the house of Israel, the way of the Lord is not equal. O house of Israel, are not my ways equal? Are not your ways unequal? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, saith the Lord God. Return, I'm sorry, repent and return, bleh, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions, so iniquity shall not be your ruin. 
Cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby you've transgressed, and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, saith the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and live ye. He's saying here, they are saying that his ways are not equal, that basically that he's not fair. And he's saying, well, no, I'm right and you're wrong. So when man has a certain way of doing things, when man has a certain standard of right and wrong, and God has a different standard of right and wrong, we need to go with God's standard, and God's standard is found written in the Bible. Amen. Now, without the Bible, and without God telling us what is right and what is wrong, we really have no concrete way to determine what is right and wrong. For example, I was speaking at the community college in a philosophy class, And I put, forth the, I put forth the statement that without the Bible and without invoking God as our creator, it's impossible to really say that murder is wrong. You can't really prove that murder is wrong. And basically, I asked the class, I said, well, who here believes that murder is wrong? And every single person believed it was wrong. I said, well, who here believes that the Bible is the word of God? You know, very few. Who here even believes in God at all? Only like half the class. Most of them had been indoctrinated in this thing of the Big Bang and evolution and everything just came from nothing, magically appearing out of thin air. So I said to them, okay, well, prove to me that murder is wrong. Why is, why is it wrong for me to murder? Because I said, according to what I believe, murder is wrong because the Bible says, thou shalt do no murder. Why is murder wrong? Because God said so. Amen. Because it's in the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Okay, now you prove to me that murder is wrong. And they're like, well, it's just, it's just wrong. <laughs> I mean, everybody knows it's wrong. What? How? Prove that it's wrong. What if, what, if somebody, what if somebody says, well, I think it's okay to kill people in certain situations. I think it's okay to murder someone. You know, if you need to basically gain some advantage on that or whatever. And, and they said, well, no, no, it's wrong because it, it hurts other people. It harms other people. And I said, okay, well, why is it wrong to hurt other people? I said, according to your doctrine of the Big Bang and evolution, we're all just animals anyway. We all just are chance beings that are just an evolved animal. And I said, look at the animal kingdom. They kill each other all the time. Are they wrong? I asked, is a, is a dog who kills another dog committing murder? Is it committing sin? Is it wrong? And they're confounded. No one could answer that. No one could prove that because there is no way to prove it because without God, without the Bible, then everything would be permissible. Yep, right. Think about it. If we're just animals, if we're just a chemical concoction from the Big Bang, then we could pretty much do whatever we want. Our lives are meaningless. Eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. And so without God's word, without the Bible, there is no foundation for morality at all except just every man doing what's right in his own eyes. Right. And if you talk to an honest atheist, they'll admit this. I talked to a guy that I knew who's what I call an evangelical atheist. You know, one of these ones who, he's not just an atheist. I mean, he's serious about being an atheist. He preaches atheism. And I confronted this guy with the idea that, well, if there's no God, then basically you have no authority to say what is right and wrong because it's just in every man's own eyes. And I said, how can you prove that murder is wrong? How can you prove that adultery is wrong? How can you prove that anything's wrong? I do animals abide by thou shalt not commit adultery. Do animals abide by thou shalt not kill? And he was honest. Here's what he said. He said, well, you're right. As an atheist, all I'm left with is just a subjective morality. He said, you know, there is no absolute right and wrong. So at least that atheist admitted it. But, you know, 90-some percent of atheists that you talk to are too foolish to even understand what you're saying. And they think that, well, no, murder's wrong, period. Based on what? Based on you? Are you God? So God's word must be the final authority for us as Christians on what is right or wrong. We're not like this atheistic world that just goes through life making our own rules up as we go. But we have a standard here. We have God's word that never changes. We have God's commandments. Now, when you think about the Ten Commandments, right? And, and a lot of people, even unsaved people, even non-Christian people, are pretty familiar with the Ten Commandments. And, and if you ask someone, hey, have you ever heard of the Ten Commandments? 99% of people have heard of it. And it's been looked at as just a basic 
teaching of morality as just kind of a foundational doctrine of what is right and what is wrong. And obviously there are many more commandments in the Bible than the Ten Commandments. But if we just look at the Ten Commandments and we compare the Ten Commandments with the new morality in America, you will find that six of these Ten Commandments have absolutely no place in the new morality. The new morality in America only retains four of the Ten Commandments, okay? Because if you think about it, the first of the Ten Commandments is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Right. I mean, that's not even on the radar of this new, this new morality in America. They don't even believe in God. Okay, number two, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Sorry, you know, carving statues of people or animals uh, out of metal or, or wood. Okay, that's not on the radar in the new morality. Okay, third commandment, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Is that something that this new morality cares anything about? No. Four, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Again, is that even on the radar? Anything that has to do with God, they're not interested. Obviously, the Old Testament Sabbath, resting upon the seventh day, and the New Testament, Jesus is our Sabbath, etc. Whole nother sermon in and of itself. But number five, honor thy father and mother. If you look at the way the Bible interprets that honor there, and you look at what Jesus taught about that, honor there is talking about also caring for your parents in old age, paying for them, basically, when they're old, taking care of them financially, okay? That's part of that. Not only obedience is also part of that, and also honoring them with your substance, taking care of them when they're old. No, the government does that, you know, and, and people are told, hey, you got to save up for that so you don't burden your children, etc., etc. So the first five are not really on the radar in the new morality, okay? So then we get to the, the next one, thou shalt not kill. And again, our ungodly world would agree with us on that. You know, the America... Uh, the American culture in 2015 would agree that killing is wrong, murder is wrong. Obviously, they make exceptions to that with abortion and everything. But, of course, you know, in general, they'd say, yeah, don't murder. In general, they'd say, yeah, don't commit adultery. At least most people would say that. Hey, thou shalt not steal. Most people in America would agree with that, even if they're not Christians. But when we get to thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, again, most people would agree. Hey, don't, don't lie under oath. Don't testify against someone and falsely accuse them. But then we get to the 10th commandment, thou shalt not covet. Most people don't even know what the word covet means, let alone. And when you explain to people what covet means, they're like, that's a sin? Really? Coveting is when you desire something that belongs to someone else. And not that you would take it away from them and make it your own. Oh, no. It's when you look at someone who has more than you and you envy them and say, well, I wish I had a house like that. I wish I had a car like that. And again, most people are incredulous that that's even a sin. But it is a sin to covet that which you do not have. So out of the Ten Commandments, six of them are not even on the radar in this new morality the only four that are retained are thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, and thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. But if we would go to France today, did you know that 60% of people in France think that it's okay to commit adultery? 60% of them think that, hey, you know, as long as, and most of them would just say, you know, just be discreet about it. You know, just don't rub their nose in it, at least keep it a secret, hide it. But 60% are saying it's not even wrong. We're not talking about how many have done it. We're saying how many would say it's fine. Germany is, is close to that level in the 50s would say it's fine. More than half of people in these countries think that adultery is okay. So basically they're down to like three of the Ten Commandments over in these places. And then if you factor in abortion, well, now they're down to like two. Okay, so the reason I'm reading all this scripture and showing you all this is just to show you by way of introduction that there's a big difference between God's word and the new morality, isn't there? Are they the same? Is it pretty much common sense? I mean, we all, no, no, there's a big difference between this new morality and God's word. It's not the same thing. It's different. Now, just the word morality itself, what does it mean? Well, if you look at the word morality, first of all, if you speak Spanish, it helps you see where some of our English words come from because a lot of our English words are Latin-based, okay? And in Spanish, there's a verb, morar, which means to dwell somewhere. It's, it's the place where you live, okay? Where you dwell is where you would morar, all right? That's where morality comes from, okay? It has to do with what is right and wrong where you live. That's what morality means in your culture that you're a part of. Also, another word that's similar to morality is the word ethics. 
And the word ethic comes from the same root word as the word ethnic. And when we talk about ethnic, we're talking about what country someone's from. Well, ethics is, again, what is right and wrong based on what society says is right and wrong around you. So even the word morality itself, it has to do with the fact that it's what the people around you accept as right and wrong. That's what morality is, which is why the Bible doesn't use the word morality ever. Because God doesn't care about morality and ethics. God cares about his law, Amen. his word, righteousness, unrighteousness based on what he says. But the modern versions have brought in this word morality. Okay. And let me uh, give you an, an example. The first example I want to give, the difference between the new morality and God's word is on the subject of fornication. Now, fornication is people who have uh, intimate physical relationship before they're married. Okay. This is known in the Bible as fornication. God's law says that we should keep that within marriage. The Bible says marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. So that's God's standard, but here's the world's standard. Well, hey, as long as it's consensual, as long as everybody's 18, as long as you're consensual, and as long as you love each other, right? then it's okay. I mean, that's what the world thinks. Your average person today in America does not think it is wrong to do that before you're married, do they? I mean, your average person in America today thinks it's totally fine. In fact, they think you're crazy if you say, hey, you have to wait till you're married to have that physical relationship. Whoa, are you serious? That's the way the world looks at it. That's a pretty big difference between God's standard. But the Bible says... First of all, if you would flip over to 1 Thessalonians 4, the Bible says in 2 John verse 6, it says, this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. So the Bible says that love is when we walk after his commandments. The Bible says love is the fulfilling of the law. But yet they'll say, well, if you love each other, it's fine. But here's the thing, fornicating with someone is not an act of love. It's an act of disrespect, it's an act of defilement, and it is not love according to the Bible. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Verse 7, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. 1 Corinthians 6. So God's word says abstain from fornication. It needs to be kept within marriage. The new morality says, well, as long as you love each other, you know, as long as it's consensual, or here's what they'll say, just do it safely. You, use protection, do it safely. That's what they're teaching the kids today. That's what TV is teaching them. That's what our society is teaching them in the new morality. Whereas the Bible says no to fornication. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 18. Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Why? To avoid fornication. Keep that physical relationship where it belongs within the bounds of marriage. That's what the Bible's teaching here. And so this is God's word on the subject and it trumps man's morality. Now, what the new modern versions will do is, like for example, the NIV, the most popular version in America today, they'll take out the word fornication and you know what they'll replace it with? Sexual immorality. And what's immorality mean? Basically what society says is wrong, what the culture says is wrong. So you could interpret that if you have an NIV you can interpret that, well, sexual immorality, that's if you don't love each other. Right. Or that's if you're not doing it safely. Or that's if it's a one-night stand. Or that's if it's not consensual. They can make it mean whatever they want. And I've literally sat in a Baptist youth service of a, of a, of a Baptist church, a youth group, and literally had a student argue with the teacher and say, well, I don't think it's wrong to go to bed with somebody before you're married. Prove it to me from the Bible. And the teacher couldn't do it. Teacher couldn't prove it. Because these new versions have made so many changes, it makes it hard to even prove that from the Bible. 
But of course, if you're reading a King James Bible, there's plenty of teachings against fornication and how we need to be married and, and et cetera, et cetera. So that just shows you how dangerous these new versions are. This is why we're King James Bible only here. We don't want this idea of morality in the Bible. No, we want God's law, God's word, concrete. This is right, this is wrong. Black, white, not this gray area. But not only that, go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. Another thing that the, the new morality has this, this thing of cussing versus what God's word says about blasphemy. Now here's what's funny. If you watch a show on TV, they'll bleep things out. If they take a movie from Hollywood and bring it to the TV, they have to clean it up for TV so they'll censor it, right? So they say, hey, we got to remove the profanity, remove the cussing. But you know what they never remove? Here's what they never remove. God's name in vain. So basically, according to the new morality, blaspheming Christ is fine. So on TV, they'll have a children's show and it could say Jesus and Christ and oh my God and just throw out all these blasphemies toward the names of God. And that's all fine and dandy. But then they'll turn around and label words that the Bible uses as cuss words. They'll take biblical terms and say, oh, that's a bad word. That's a cuss word. And honestly, I think the devil's behind it. Because people will then feel that the Bible is just this, you know, this, this um, profane book or the Bible is just so uncouth or rough, you know, because we're taught our whole lives that hell is a bad word. Right? We're taught our whole lives that that damn is a bad word or that bastard is a bad word. You know, these are biblical terms that God uses. And look what the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 3. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil, surmisings. What does the Bible say? God's words are wholesome words. And the Bible says every word of God is pure. He's a shield unto them that put their trust in him. So to sit there and take biblical words and say those are bad words, those are cuss words, those are inappropriate words. Words like piss, bastard, hell, damn. Everybody's like, oh, Pastor Aaron's got Tourette's syndrome. No, I'm talking about biblical terms that we should use. I'm not going to stop using these words because Tipper Gore said no. Because these words are biblical words. And look, I'm glad that the Bible uses some strong language sometimes to make some strong points. Amen. It's not like these weak, watered-down versions of the Bible that soften everything up. No, God speaks with some strong language, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I'll tell you what's wrong. Blaspheming Jesus. Amen. Blaspheming God. But they'll bleep out all the blasphemies. Against, uh, they'll bleep out all the, the biblical cuss words, and then they'll include a bunch of blasphemies against Jesus and everything else. It's hypocrisy, my friend. So what are you going to believe? The world's morality? The new morality? Or go with God's standard and God's law? And let that be the, the determination. But not only that, go to Ephesians chapter 4. Here's another difference between God's law and the new morality. See, according to the new morality in America, all negative emotions are pretty much wrong. Basically, here's what they'll tell you. Hatred, always wrong. Fear, always wrong. Uh, they'll say, anger, always wrong. Anytime you see anybody getting angry, they'll say, oh, that's bad, that's wrong. Don't ever get angry. Anger's wrong. Or, oh, man, you're not supposed to ever hate anyone for any reason. Or, oh, man, you know, fear, that's bad. You're preaching on hell, you're teaching fear. That's wrong, that's bad. So according to the world, fear, anger, hatred are always wrong. That's part of their new morality. Everything's just got to be positive all the time. Isn't that part of the new morality in America today? Is that what God's word teaches? Look what the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. The Bible says, be ye angry and sin not. Now, if anger is a sin, how is that even possible? If anger is a sin, then how can I be angry and sin not? I mean, that'd be like saying, you know, go outside without leaving this building. It wouldn't make any sense, would it? No, he says, be angry and sin not. How do I do that? He says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. So there is a time to be angry for a righteous cause. Like the Bible says in Matthew 5, 22, it's a sin to be angry with your brother without a cause, the Bible says. 
course, all the new versions take out without a cause and just say, oh, it's just a sin to be angry with your brother. No, no, no. It's angry to be an it, bleh. It's a sin to be angry with them without a cause. And when we look at the life of Jesus, there were times when he was angry. In Mark chapter 3, he was going to heal a man on the Sabbath day who had a withered hand in the synagogue. His hand was withered up. And when he asked them whether it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath day, it says that Jesus looked upon them all with anger. He had anger that they would be so heartless that they didn't want this guy's hand to be healed. It made Jesus mad. What about when Jesus made a whip of cords and went in to the temple and drove out the money changers and Jesus flipped over the tables and dumped out the money? What about the fact that God is angry with the wicked every day? Right. But today we're taught, no, anger is wrong. Don't ever get angry. And then a lot of people bottle up so much anger, they have worse problems. Sometimes you have to let out your anger a little bit. Yeah. Some anger is healthy. Now, I will say this. Most of the time, our anger is misplaced. And probably the vast majority of times that Christians are angry, they're usually sinning. Because there are so many times that we're not supposed to be angry. We're not supposed to be quick to anger. We're not supposed to be angry over dumb things that don't matter. But there is a time and a place when anger is righteous. That's why the Bible says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. You jump down to verse 31, it says... Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. This is not a contradiction. Here's what he's saying. Get angry when there's a righteous cause to be angry. But then he says to put off anger when you're done. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Put off anger. And he says, be kind and tender hearted, forgiving one another. So, Sometimes there's an appropriate time to get angry, but when you're done being angry, then you forgive and you move on. You don't just harbor that anger and become bitter. You see the difference? So is anger just in general wrong? No, it becomes a sin when you hang on to it and become bitter and, and dwell on it and go from day to day being angry. That's the sin. They say, oh, hatred, it's all wrong. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.8, there's a time to love and a time to hate. Time of war and a time of peace. Uh, they say, oh, fear is bad. Don't scare people. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 says, let us, hear the whole let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. All throughout the Bible, it says over and over again, fear the Lord, fear God, fear the Lord. And people will sometimes try to say, well, fear doesn't really mean fear. They'll say fear there just means respect. Okay, why did it say fear and trembling? Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. With fear and trembling as the servants of Christ, the Bible says. Over and over again, it couples fear with trembling. Well, you don't just tremble out of respect. You tremble because you're scared. Yeah. Now, the Bible teaches that we should not fear anyone except God. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. But hundreds of times he says that fearing God is a good thing. Fearing man is not good. Fearing Satan is not good. But we're told over and over again to fear God. So if we preach on hell to put the fear of God into people, we're doing right. The Bible says some save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. I mean, we just destroyed the new morality in that verse. We got fear, we got hating, anger. It's all there. No, Obi-Wan taught us that this is the path to the dark side. Fear, fear is the path to the dark side. Oh, hey, Luke, use the force. Don't use anger. But see, this is how the devil has brainwashed us, right? If we have any fear or anger or hatred, you know, we're going to become Darth Vader or something and go to the dark side. This is what the world is telling us today. And it comes from the teachings of Buddhism. Yeah. That's all Star Wars is, is basically a repackaged Buddhism. But people take it real seriously. They watch Star Wars and they think it's real. I got a book in the a big, thick book. Not a booklet, a book. And it was written by some guy, and, and he sent me this book. He's like, you need to read this book, Pastor Anderson. Okay, and it was a book about how God has spoken to us through the Bible, the Quran, and Star Wars. <laughs> and they weren't kidding. And he's showing us how they all three books, the Bible, the Quran, and Star Wars, they're all teaching the same morality. And how, you know, when George Lucas made Star Wars, he thought he was just making fiction. But in reality, he was inspired by God. 
That's what this book said. And it said that Jedi is short for Jesus disciple. That's what it said. And he said, you know, and it was explaining the force and all that. But actually what it is, is just borrowed from Eastern mysticism. But how many things of our new morality in America are not based on the Bible, they're based on Star Wars. Or they're based on, and you know, you can laugh at that, but honestly, you know it's true that this is what people think today. You know that most people out there will say, oh yeah, hatred is the dark side. Fear, <laughs> wrath, you know, uh, hatred, fear, anger. Oh, this is all bad. These are all bad things. You know, we need to breathe in all the positivity then breathe out all the anger and fear and hate. Oh, <laughs> this is our culture today because people are quoting Gandhi more than they're quoting Jesus. Love the sinner, hate the sin, quote from Gandhi, right? That's their new morality. They quote Gandhi, they're quoting Star Wars, they're quoting Buddha, and they think that this is somehow righteous when the Bible has a completely different morality. You know, the God of the Bible, he has anger, he has hatred. He says, you better be afraid of me, I'm God, I'm the Lord, fear me. Amen. But they don't believe that. So you see, there's a big difference between the new morality and God's word. We are influenced by Eastern mysticism, which is nothing more than Satanism, okay? The gods that the Hindus worship are devils. They, this, all these serpents and flames and half male, half female gods that they worship, it's of the devil. Buddhism, this thing of emptying out your mind, empty yourself, Luke, and let the force flow through you. You know, you sit there and meditate and, it, and basically they're dealing with unclean spirits. Because they go into these uh, meditative trance-like states, whether it's Zen Buddhism or yoga or whatever, and they're basically inviting in the unclean spirits. And that's why they have these enlightening experiences out of body and all this stuff. You know, we need to watch out and not let this stuff tell us what's right and wrong. Not let the world tell us what's right and wrong. We need to dig into the scriptures and figure out what's right and wrong. Look, we're living in a day. Here's another difference between the new morality and God's word. We're living in a day where killing your own dog is a felony. I mean, like, the, remember Old Yeller? That's a felony now, okay? And here's the thing, but here's the thing, but killing your unborn child's fine. Wow. That's the new morality in America. Right, right. You can't kill your dog, but you can kill your unborn child. Yeah. That's the new morality. Lifting up animals to the level of people, calling them children and babies and all these different things. And then what about this new morality? The Bible says be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Here's the new morality. If you have children, you're being irresponsible. You just used up my carbon credits, buddy. Seriously. And, you know, this isn't as much in, in America today, but it's coming. But in Europe, this is the mentality. I mean, if you travel to Europe with a family like mine, you get dirty looks everywhere you go. People are just, how dare you overpopulate? You're single-handedly overpopulating the earth, Pastor Anderson. Are you nuts? Because they've been brainwashed with this depopulation agenda, Mother Earth, and we need to reduce the population to 500 million and all this stuff. So God's morality says, be fruitful, multiply. Children are inheritance of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Happy is the man that hath this quiver full of them. But the world says, shame on you for being so irresponsible and having all these children. You're supposed to adopt those children once we take them away from a crackhead. What are you doing? <laughs> Right. <laughs> You're not supposed to produce children yourselves. You're supposed to buy them from us, and then we can make sure that you never spank them or teach them the Bible. But anyway, you know, the new morality lifts animals above humans. Yep. Oh, yeah. The new morality wants to control the population and depopulate and be responsible about having children. God's morality says, hey, enjoy your wife. Be fruitful and multiply. Children are a blessing. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You know, the new morality says drinking alcohol is fine. Drinking alcohol is fine, but drugs are evil. That's the new morality. No, the Bible condemns both when it says be sober. Amen. Be sober. You're not sober when you're drunk. You're not sober when you're smoking pot. The Bible says be sober, but the world says, well, drugs are wrong because, you know, we said so, but alcohol is fine. It's, it's, it's uh, hypocritical and inconsistent. The Bible teaches that we should spank our children. The Bible says he that spareth his rod hateth his son. 
but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. The Bible says, withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. But the world says positive reinforcement and that if you spank, you're a bad parent. So look how God's law and the new morality are diametrically opposed. New morality says if you spank your children, you're abusive. You spank your children, you're a bad parent. God's law says you hate your child if you don't spank them. Right. He says you're a terrible parent if you don't spank. These two things are very different. So who do we listen to, the new morality or God's law? Not only that, but today many people with child rearing have even taken it a step further to not just saying don't spank your children, now to the point where they'll say, don't even tell them no. Don't even rebuke them. Basically, it's just a positive only child rearing. This thing of attachment parenting, have you heard of this? Isn't that the one, Juja? Attachment parenting, where it's just, it's all positive and coddling, and you never tell them that it was bad what they did. You just tell them like, Let's find a better way to do that, shall you know? I think there's a better way. Or you just distract them, you know. Well, here, let's, why don't we just put the chainsaw down because over here, you know, are some fun toys. So it's just all about just distracting them and positive reinforcement and praising them. That's garbage. And you know what? It only works for people who have one kid. Maybe two. Because if you, if you had eight kids and tried to go by this new morality, this attachment parenting, you know, you'd be, they'd kill you. Your children would literally, there's more of them. They'd team up on you and tie you up and kill you. Because these kids are so evil that are raised where they're never taught right and wrong. Everything's fine. And they're always the brattiest, most unhappy, disrespectful children. You know, it's funny, if our parenting is so bad, if spanking your children is so bad, how come I take my eight children out in public and get compliments every single time on how well behaved the children are? And I'm thinking to myself, they're not even being good today. <laughs> this is a bad day for them. But the, but the worldly people are like, oh, wow, your kids are really obedient. I'm like, what are you talking about? Are you nuts? But that's because they're used to their little brat at home that's swinging from the chandelier, you know what I mean, and won't listen to anything, and is basically, you know, telling their parents to go jump in a lake. Now, you're making mommy sad when you do that, you know, and remember, sadness is going to lead me to the dark side, all right? So, you know, this is the world that we're living in today. Not only that, go to, go to Genesis chapter 4. Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 4, because here's another teaching of the new morality. The new morality says, hey, respect all religions. Respect all views. Don't judge or condemn anyone for any reason. Just respect everyone for all reasons, right? Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Because Cain is one who is symbolic in the Bible of a false prophet. In 2 Peter chapter 2, when false prophets are being described, he says, woe unto them because they've gone in the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and are perished in the gainsaying of Korah. So according to the Bible, Cain, Balaam, and Korah are basically prototypes for the false prophets of the New Testament. He said these guys symbolize what false prophets are about. And so when we look at Cain, we see in verse number three, it says, And in process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. Amen. And it says Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. The Bible is not saying let's respect everyone. Let's respect all views. Let's respect all religions. No, it says, look, when you disobey God, and you bring the wrong offering, when you make a false religion and you're a false prophet, God doesn't have respect for you. There's no respect for you or for your religion. I don't respect Islam. I don't respect Muhammad. I don't respect Buddhism. I don't respect any of these things. Why? They're false. They're lies. Why would I respect lies? But the new morality says, well, we need to respect all views, respect all religion, respect all sides. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. The Bible says that the preacher should reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Not to just be tolerant of any and all 
faiths and teachings and, and religions? No. But in the new morality, no one can ever judge, rebuke, or condemn anyone or anything. You know in America today that judge not is the mantra that is repeated over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Judge not, right? judge not, judge not, right? judge not. But then the world, you know, they have all their judges. That'll ju it's okay for the government to judge, but a religious leader can't judge. Dad can't judge. Mom can't judge. The pastor can't judge. Oh, but the government can judge. Like they're the only authority anymore. That's the new morality, friend. In the new morality, the government is God. Whatever's legal is right. Whatever's illegal is wrong. That's the new morality in America today. Not only that, but in the new morality, there are no gender roles. Men and women are all the same in the new morality. See, in the Bible, wives are supposed to obey their husbands. In the new morality, that's an abomination. That's called abuse in the new morality. You know, if you have a biblical marriage where the wife is in her proper role and the husband's in his proper role, that's an abusive marriage. I mean, literally, I remember even, you know, 13, 14 years ago being at the hospital when my wife was pregnant with Solomon and they had signs up, you know, this is how to know you're in an abusive relationship. And it was like, wait a minute, this is describing my marriage. <laughs> you know, it's like your husband, is, you know, thinks he's the boss. He tells you not to be friends with other men. And so I'm like, what? That's, that's marriage. What do you mean? <laughs> Hello? But see what I'm saying about how that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of the Lord. And you see how there are those who call good evil and evil good. They put sweet for bitter, bitter for sweet, light for darkness, darkness for light. Here's what I'm trying to get across with this sermon. Because I could just go on and on and have all the different examples. You know, we talked about fornication. We talked about cussing. We talked about fear, hatred, and anger. We talked about animal rights, population control, alcohol, drugs, child rearing, respecting all views, don't ever condemn anyone, gender. You know, we could go on and on because there are just an infinite number of differences, right? Right. But here's the point that I'm trying to get across in this sermon. The point is that when we take a stand for what is right and what is wrong, it better come from the Bible. Fear God and keep His commandments this is the whole duty of man. Okay, that's it. So don't let the new morality come in and tell you what's right and wrong. We need to base what we believe on the Bible. And it's great to have strong views about what's right and what's wrong. I mean, if you're going to lead your family, if you're going to lead your children, if you're going to lead a church, you better know what's right and what's wrong so that you can teach people how God wants us to live. But you have to make sure that you're not just regurgitating stuff that you saw in a movie, something that you saw on TV, something that you heard in school. And we need to make sure that this new morality does not become our morality. This needs to be our morality, quote unquote, the Bible, God's word. Because the new morality is very different on all of these subjects. It's very different than what God's word is. That's why if we follow God's word, the Bible says we'll be a peculiar people because we're living differently than the people around us. The people around us, they think, well, if I protect the environment and have no kids and, you know, affirm every sodomite that I can get near, then basically I'm a wonderful person. And, and especially, and I didn't even have this in my sermon, but, you know, according to the new morality, just making a lot of money, that's success. But God says he's chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him. So according to the Bible, gain is not godliness. But according to the world, that's success. So we need to make sure to live our lives according to the Bible and not according to the course of this world. And in America today, there's a big difference. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your word, Lord. And we just pray that you would just help us to study, Lord, our Bibles and read and read and read and figure out what is right and what is wrong in every situation by studying the scriptures daily, Lord and not just going along with what society has told us. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.